now be moving on to our next session, VFX versus traditional DOP. Challenges for cinematographers with the increasing use of VFX in cinemas. And this session is being sponsor sponsored by NY VFX Wala, the VFX people, Mumbai. Huge round of applause for that video. So the rise of VFX has allowed production houses to forego stunning natural backdrops which have been the canvas for cinematographers to paint their art on. But shooting for later VFX processing is a challenging as well, is very challenging I believe. Despite modern day cinematographers having taken this in processing is a challenge. Their stride but will, more, uh, but will more such modern technologies limit their creativity and need? Is modern technology a threat to the realism portrayed by gifted cinematographers? This discussion follows the thought process of eminent stakeholders of the industry on VFX. Other emerging processing technologies and their impact on traditional cinema capturing techniques. I would like to invite onto the dais Ms. Priya Seth, Mr. K.K. Senthil Kumar, Mr. Peter Drapers, and Mr. Naveen Paul for our second interactive session discussion of the day. Mr. Uh, Ms. Priya Seth is a cinematographer and she's done the film Airlift. Mr. Pete Drapers is the chief technical director and co-founder of Makuta VFX. Mr. Senthil Kumar is the cinematographer for Bahubali, Mr. Naveen Paul is the co-founder and creative head of NY VFX Wala. I now hand over the mic to Mr. Naveen Paul, who will be moderating the discussion today. Hi, uh, good evening everybody. Uh, in fact, I'm not briefed what I'm supposed to talk right now, but then probably I'm the moderator, so I'll give a go ahead, heads up to Mr. Senthil Kumar, Pete and uh, Priya to probably talk on the topic that uh, this gentleman just said. So uh, I think let's start with Pete and uh, probably Senthil and uh, Priya can start. Hello. Hi. Hello. I've got some, uh, got some of my guys here. Hello, everybody. Don't heckle. So uh, for me, uh, working with obviously, I mean, we, we oh, hello, that went. Um, we take our lead from people like uh, Sentinel and Priya. So I don't really feel it, in essence it's basically a competitive element, the more of a collaborative, co uh, definitely a collaborative, because basically when it comes to set work, we're bouncing ideas, he's obviously driving it naturally, but and then we follow his vision, we follow uh, the conversation and trying to determine the sort of style and the sort of aesthetic when it comes to the lighting, when it comes to a shoot. So he'll instruct exactly what sort of things we'll try and follow i mean even in this very floor itself when we were shooting boldly i've got ptsd from getting the shakes now <laughs> so taking his lead we're actually driving the aesthetic not only actually on camera itself but also afterwards so i mean for me i'd like to know really how did you find the experience did you did you find it was uh, enjoyable problematic because I know we had some little arguments so yeah I just like to pass the sandal about that oh. 
actually the topic was supposed to be like uh, challenges for a cinematographer in uh, increasing vf incre with uh, increasing number of vfx films being done or increasing number of vfx shots in a film so actually uh, see finally first and foremost we should understand that filmmaking is about storytelling so vfx is actually helping filmmakers all over the world tell their story in a better way probably like before vfx was involved so much there were traditional ways of doing uh, effects like we had the back projection and so many things so now we are moved at moved to a point where we can imagine whatever we want to and uh, that pete and team can uh, really fulfill that dream so it's actually like as he told it's a very collaborative effort which happens right from the pre-production stages till the post it's a uh, ongoing process right from the time the director tells the idea to how it is being transported on screen. At some places, the cinematographer takes the center stage. At some places, the VFX guys take the center stage. So it's a very collaborative process. And uh, the challenges are, yeah, as uh, the technology is incre in increasing in its own way, making things easier for us. So it's learning and keeping up to the technology is the biggest challenge which happens. and. Uh, uh, I am being surrounded with people like Pete and uh, Kamal and Srinivas Mohan so, who helped me upgrade my knowledge. So it has, it has always been a challenging experience. So whenever you are shooting any film for that matter, it's challenging. And VFX film, it's a little bit more challenging because you have to coordinate with uh, lots of people. And at every stage, you are questioned. I, I know Pete, like when you put the camera, you always tell, okay, what is the height of the camera, whether it's tilted one angle, two degrees. So we have to even take care of all those things. So coordinating with uh, them is a, a bit challenging. So then probably. I think uh, we should just give one round of applause to Mr. Senthil for being so, uh, so, uh, I mean, uh, really, I mean, he's a, he's a big cinematographer and uh, really happy to know that uh, he has such high regards for VFX. So I think, uh, Priya, I think you should just... I, I'd just like to ask one question. Where do you think in the, I mean, in the entire scope, because we traveled together for what, about four years on this, where do you think it went right and where do you think it went wrong? Where do you, and where did it go wrong and how? It uh, actually like, uh, when you are doing uh, any film for that matter, director has a certain idea of what he wants. So we all start off very enthusiastically. By the time we end the film, we are fighting because we don't have time. So <laughs> that is the biggest factor we are always uh, fighting for. So it always feels that if we had little more time, we could have done better. So that is the thing or else like, uh, uh, and probably like uh, the fights make it more, uh, what I can say, worth uh, remembering what and how it happened and all. So the best part of what I learned in Bahubali is uh, the concept art and uh, pre-visualization. That is uh, what really opens up your mind and gives you a clarity of uh, thought that where we are heading. So when you have concept art towards you and when you are doing your uh, pre-visualization, it really puts everyone onto the same page. Because like I might be thinking something different, he might be thinking different, she might be thinking something different when you talk about a rose. So everyone has a certain uh, way of looking at it. So when a concept art comes in or when a pre-visualization comes in, then we are everyone on uh, on the same page. So that is the best part of probably how films should be made. We should all, to start with, be on the same page. Then as things keep progressing, we have challenges and differences and all that. Well, I think uh, they've summed it up pretty well because there's no question that we're on opposing sides with VFX ever. And I think more and more our jobs with VFX is getting more and more combined. And when you start out a film, if you start out with both departments being on the same page, it's only going to better what we're going to get because very often what happens on a set is sometimes you don't have enough time to light something in a particular way or you have enough time to finish something. And it's not only about special effects, but it's also about things like cleanups and sometimes polishing the work that we haven't been able to do on set. But for us to know that it can be done later, you need to know, you need to understand what, you know, people like yourselves actually do. And if we're on the same page, it allows us then to take our work a little more, you know, polished and finished if you're not able to do it. Because very often, you know, budgets are short, time is tight, but you know that we have people like you to just take it over if we can't do it on set. I mean, on, on, on some shoots on, and some productions, what we've, what we've noticed in some cases that it actually does actually, 
how can I put it neatly? Um, enables people to cut corners. Do you feel that that's the case? So like, okay, well, no, we'll, we'll get graphics to fix it, or is, is that there? The worst four, I mean, for VFX, the worst four words we hear on set are fix it in post, yeah. And we, we, we hate that because we, oh, hello, this microphone. We always like to see it in camera. You know, we want to basically be able to put the time, the effort, and the money uh, into the work, the, the hero shots, so to speak, that are required for that particular for the particular job itself. So, do you do you feel as a cinematographer that um, that sentiment is there, or do you feel like it is making people lax, or do you feel like it's you know people are aware that yes, we can utilize this to you know resolve some matters but you know what let's just go for another take and and uh, put the time i mean are, are you as a cinematographer aware of the amount of time things takes in post and how diluted that can be if we're actually doing more fixes than the actual creative side um yes of course and i think a lot of times what happens on set is when we get into these things of we'll fix it in post it doesn't come from the dp it comes from the producer it's whenever, you know, it's when you know you're rushing for time, it's like, oh, okay, we'll just get VFX to do that. We'll get VFX to match the light. You know, we hear that all the time. And uh, the problem is, very often, it goes out of your control on a shoot. And that comes from ignorance, from the side, I'm sorry to say, from whenever you hear this about we'll fix it in post, and you know it's unfixable because post isn't there to fix stuff. It's there sometimes just to finish it. Or, you know, sometimes you're on a corner and you paint into a corner, and then it is to be fixed. But otherwise, uh, Yes, but that's, that happens a lot and it comes purely from a place of ignorance where we hear this and we hear it either from directors or producers where we're told that, uh, oh, don't worry about that, we'll just clean it later, we'll fix that in post. And one has also realized that never trust that because then the cost of VFX goes too high and then you're left with one C stand standing in the corner of your frame. Yeah. Yeah. So. When you have blue screen all around and the only live thing that you have, the characters, so do you what what is that uh, thing that bothers you or or probably uh, how how uh, do you actually uh, you know uh, if you can explain how do you light up the shot when everything around is blue or a green screen see like that's where uh, as i told you like uh, we see one good thing about VFX is like uh, we do lots of uh, pre-production work which happens. So in the pre-production work, we are sure about what is it we are aiming at. So when you know that okay, this is what is going to be a person is going to be standing in 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 the center of a fire actually, like a round fire is there. So probably we are shooting only the character. The fire is we have to create that effect that the fire is going to be there. So those kind of things we take care of. Okay, finally we are actually shooting it keeping in mind the end result like it can be your lighting it can be the kind of angle which you keep and what you're expecting out of it so we have a clarity of thought it what is the end product so based on that what are things we have to do that we have to do obviously in coordination with the vfx guys so that's how it happens actually like so one good thing about vfx is we have to compulsorily do our pre-production work so that probably for a regular film, sometimes you might get, okay, we'll see it on the set. For, for the VFX based film, it is sometimes, yeah, we, 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 te we tend to like, okay, like, okay, let's see kind of a thing. But 99% of the time, it's always, we are very sure about what we are doing. So Pete, I think you should also tell what you think about it when you, when you, when you shoot something like this. 99% of the time, we're sure what we're doing, maybe we'll actually achieve maybe 60% because there's always going to be, always going to be some, uh, third party element which is going to cause an issue that we'll have to you know bounce ideas back and forth and to come up with something that we can actually utilize we can visualize at the end of the day I mean for uh, for whenever it comes to a shot that has a blue mat if it's not been decided in advance that's when you know we start having issues the cinematography starts having issues the cinematographer starts having issues as well because neither of us can visualize what it is unless it's determined in advance if it's a case of, you know, we get the direction to say, oh, we'll sort that out later. Well, he doesn't know how to light or compose. We don't know what's going on there, so we can't advise. So again, like Sendel mentioned, the pre-production is essential for that. It actually is totally, totally essential for it. What we did in the first Bowley feature was that in the uh, city center itself, we actually had a, 
uh, a real-time version of the physical set. So every time we were lensing up, we'd measure up and we'd run off the cabin and using a split monitor, we'd showcase to him and the director where all the extension work was going to be. There's a, you know, just a rough um, uh, uh, crossfade so that he can determine, okay, the character, the live action character, like uh, Dev Senna, for example, needs to be offset to slightly, or he can swing the camera around slightly just to compose the, uh, the temple behind, you know, more favorably, for example. Or what we can actually do, uh, depending on whether or not that was practical or not, is move things slightly uh, um, when we get back to studio, just to compose. Just like, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd adjust things for composition in live, you're framing for the you're, you're framing for the camera. You're framing, you're lensing for that. You're composing for that. You're lighting for that. So we all love doing single camera work as opposed to dual camera work because then you start having issues and so on. So we like lensing and setting up lighting and balancing for that particular shot as well. But again, sometimes you know things don't go 100 percent to plan. It, it happens. It's you know it's a creative process. So you've got the majority of it. Then there's this little bit that we need to, okay, we need to tweak. If I remember correctly for Magadira, to get the actual uh, idea for the height of the buildings and so on, that we erected balloons. There was actually some very large inflatable balloons that were up there in the, in the space over M City. And this gave him an idea exactly where, okay, this is going to be the height of this building. So when he's composing the shot and he needs to have a character which is dwarfed by this massive structure, he knew where the, where the top of this building needed to be so he could frame it for top of gate or you know, wanted to compose off it and so on. So I thought it was about six balloons in that, in that show, something like that. We, we didn't have that luxury in the King's Court in, uh, in city centre because the King's Palace was like, we, we lovingly called it the tombstone because it just looked like something that you know, someone would be buried in front of. It was huge. It was like a kilometre high almost, and it wasn't possible to stick high. You know, it wasn't easy. But it's just, again, getting, getting that, uh, that balance of, yes, we can achieve this in camera, and then we can achieve this in camera, and then we, we, if necessary, if we need to adjust after the fact, we can adjust after the fact. I think what I find with um, when you're shooting against a blue screen or green screen is you miss some of the, of course, the prep stuff and you know you get all the technicalities right and we get the lighting and all of that because we previs. I think what I miss when I'm not on a set, on a live action set, is just some of the organic experience of being in the environment and you know to want to react to something or to see what's interacting with what or just being, you know, when sometimes you're in a beautiful place and you're you're in the space, you tend to change things because it feels right at the moment. And when you're shooting against blue or green screen, you have to pretty much trust your homework as opposed to the idea that you can maybe feel something or change it. And I struggle with that sometimes because I work quite instinctively. So when you're shooting against that, you're pretty prepped and you know that this is the way you're going to go. And you can't really, I don't know how else to explain it. You know, the texture I find a bit lacking when we're doing that. Exactly, and I think for actors it makes a big difference because the actors struggle with working against big green backings as opposed to, I mean, they're the ones who need to react the most to the environment and they find it the hardest. And as narrative filmmakers, we are reacting to what the actors are reacting to. So I find that a bit disconnected. Yeah, uh, from my side, I think uh, the best way, the organic thing that you're talking about, I think that's the right term that uh, uh, most of us miss what what i think is we should we should uh, uh, you know like any exterior shot or or a, or a background that is being made is an exterior thing which is the only light source is the sun then probably we shoot everything exterior probably we can have blue screens around so so that organic thing that's something which uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> please. See, like organic is not only about light. Actually, when you say organic, it is about like, okay, like you feel, okay, like one inch the camera goes, I will see certain things or like one inch the camera goes right, left or I pan in a certain way, I'll capture something. So those kind of very instinctive decisions which a cinematographer makes 
on the set when you are shooting probably in in uh, probably like a, uh, uh, like how the actor is acting so based on that like i'll, I'll probably like maybe if i am on a zoom maybe i'll zoom in a little all, all those kind of things which actually instinctively which happens which probably sometimes yeah we do as she told totally we do miss it in when uh, we are actually like uh, in a vfx environment but uh, yeah sometimes uh, i actually take the liberty of adjusting according to the thing and i'll tell that okay like thoda post maybe we'll try to adjust it in the post so that kind of a thing we always like tend to do it here and there so how would you recommend uh, doing a day for night i mean shoot it at day and change it to night in vfx would you recommend would you not recommend no it, it depends upon the see like uh, it it purely depends upon uh, the situation where we are in probably like i would if suppose there is a light source involved in it i would try to do it in uh, the night for night six suppose like we are for example in a in a ma- mountain range or in a forest where there is no source of light or like or sometimes the area is so big that you can't light it so in those kind of a situations yeah like uh, day for night really comes in handy and uh, in both the parts part 1 and part 2 we did uh, really uh, very extensive uh, day for night sequences and uh, we actually vfx guys uh, helped us out in many ways so we used to have like a him. big big fight all the time big fight all the time according to like how to do it <laughs> it's off we always had uh, so yeah it is it is because like uh, we have to coordinate and uh, do it together because in di we tried to do it to a great extent but uh, we had to take vfx support to a great extent when uh, we had to change skies and all those kind of a things so they really vfx guys really helped us out so with vfx on your side uh, a cinematographer can achieve something which probably uh, in we i can't be done in uh, real situations or something like that but uh, it doesn't mean that okay like uh, we have to always depend on vfx there are some situations where we have to depend on it some situations so it's purely a, a situational based things pete would you recommend a day for night and if you recommend what are the uh, prerequisites that you would ask for it stand to primarily down to practicality aesthetic choice um uh, like like someone mentioned whether or not it's possible to light that entire space uh cost safety you know uh, general aesthetic of a shot that kind of thing and you know the choice to do day for night you know can can be one or multiple you know uh um reasons our job as as vfx what well, the way we tend to tackle it especially if we're lighting uh a set uh, or an extension or a character or whatever we treat it based on the raw light source and then because in essence the live set itself or the live environment itself will be graded back our cg would also be graded back in the same so as long as we're given the same amount of exposure lumens etc our stuff will also get graded back and match accordingly and then depending on the uh elements like for example sky changes etc depending on exposure in that respect then we swap those element those elements out if they are actually required so the we we tend to treat especially for bobbly and primarily in the second film we actually treated everything based on the raw input and then uh exposed based on uh on a final look and then went back and augmented additional lighting if we needed to light some other elements up in past so uh what the the ice we got at the end was something that was slightly overexposed in areas so when they brought it back down everything looked like it was balanced neatly it was actually a camera that was released or sorry not released but it was demonstrated at in Utah i think about a year ago and they had had something like uh, 64000 iso or something yeah. ri- something ridiculous and it looked like a complete day shot at night when you had these headlights come through and it, and and it just came for us at exactly the right time because we were in this middle of this day for night debate and determine the pipe went to nail that down and this came out and I went to see see look that's what it's supposed to look like at night it looks like day but the you know amount of light that goes into the aperture is less but then you've got all those other elements like for example you know uh, headlights you've got uh, you know uh, practical lights and so on the satellites and so on 
and they contribute to the localized environment. So we were in essence trying to replicate that, you know, 64,000 ISO shot day, but shot it looking like it's day, but it's shot at night, and then expose it back. And that's kind of how we came to a, a conclusion. Work at it as it was for day, and then augment after the fact by looking through a lot. Sorry, what was your question? I forgot after he spoke. <laughs> <laughs> No, we are talking about uh, doing uh, shooting at day and changing it into night yeah. in VFX. So, what do you think about so it? So, I think what happens with uh, day for night, the one thing to be careful about is uh, most often you won't be able to control the angle of light and you end up going into, you know, it starts angular, top light movement, and I think that's where it sells out a bit. Because the angle of where your supposed I guess trying to replicate a moon source with the sun is where we get into a bit of trouble with that because it just goes into a full day and you've got like this topish moonlight which isn't what you would be doing if you had a chance to light it. So I think the compromise is there in that but again you know sometimes there is no other option. You can't light areas that are that large. There's all the factors that they've already said so um, it's here to stay and the point is however we work it best. I mean, at the end of the day, day for night's been there since God knows when. I mean, back in the, you know, in the 60s, you look at the old Hammer horror films, everything's just shot with, you know, multiple ND filters in there and with a, with a color filter on. So that, that, that thing's been there since, you know, time immemorial. It's just we're doing it digitally now as opposed to, you know, in camera. That's, that's it. It's, it's, it's an aesthetic choice, a practical choice, you know, that's it. We just have to try and follow suit when it comes to the graphic side, if we need to augment. Okay, uh, Pete, next one for you. I mean, uh, wh what do you think is not possible in VFX? Apart what, from the live characters. What do I think is not possible? Nothing is impossible. It's just having the right time, money and talent uh, accessible. That's it. You know, it's the golden triangle. You affect one, it affects the other two. You want a better quality, takes longer, costs more, but it'll look awesome. That's, that's it. There's, there's, there's no, there's no limit. It's just the limits of our imaginations and it's the limits of the, you know, the, the, the technology maybe at that particular time. Give it a year and it'll, something better will come along that will give the artist who's working on it. But again, it's not the tool. It's the artist and the day. You know, you, know, you, you, you put, you know these guys in front of you know an Alexa and you'll get art you put me in front of it you'll get Ugh. so you know it's about the artist it's not the tool it's the artist at the end of the day do you want to add something to what Pete said no no as, as you told like uh, now with the VFX uh, the filmmakers can imagine anything and uh, they can do any anything as you told it is true like we need to have time and money and uh, yeah as very important is the artist who is doing on it so it is like uh, there is nothing like we can't achieve in VFX as of now that uh, films all over the world we have seen that uh, like you take an example of we create uh, what I can say outer space we create animals in life of why we create some avatar kind of a thing so it is in VFX anything and everything is possible it's just a matter of how much you can visualize and how much time you give to the VFX guys and uh, yeah that's it. I think what happens with what is possible in VFX, you know, people come to us all the time showing us references of stuff that's happened outside, which will be, you know, millions of dollars, years of preparation, and then you're supposed to achieve this in a month. So I think that's the biggest problem is that what we're expecting and what we're willing to give for it, there's no match in that. And then we turn around and say that we can't do it in India. The point is not that. No one takes into account how long and how much money it actually takes to do work the right way. And we really, you know, we throw around these references from all over the world all, and we expect this to happen in no time and money. And then everyone who's working on the job gets bad name for not doing it as well as they do it there. But that's really not the point. It's like we never, we're never willing to put in that much money into VFX and to making sure that live action and VFX actually marry and integrate as well as references that we're showing. We just don't put that much into it. Yeah, I think uh, in India, I think uh, uh, obviously like what uh, Priya said, that's absolutely right. I mean, uh, we are in a transition phase where we are all realizing that VFX is something that takes time and money. 
to to probably. The thing is, it's, it's not just here. It's it's not just here. Don't don't localize it to here. It happens in the UK. It happens in the US. It happens all over the place. Somebody sees something good, says, "I love this. It's great. I don't have the budget for it. I don't have the time for it. Uh, I need it. Give it to me." Yeah, I mean, yes. It's, uh, like, it's like it's like it's like going to a McDonald's and asking for five star cuisine. It's it it doesn't it doesn't match. But I've got a McDonald's budget, but I want a T-bone steak. You I think I, you should start the next topic now. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is, uh, can you suggest us any mandatory precautions which should be compulsory taken when we are shooting on green mat? Like uh, we have faced challenges with the costumes of the characters, the art direction, then cinematography, camera angles and movements. No, camera angles and movements are uh, not an issue. It is like how you light up your green screen and… Uh, so, mandatory should, precaution if you can point it, point out few. No, it is because it is very situational. If you are shooting in indoors, it is different. If you are shooting outdoors, it is different. What is the lighting scenario you are in? So, it is like we can't just formulate a rule and tell, okay, like if you want to light up a green screen, this should be that. No, like probably like uh, one thing mandatory is like if your character is like little far from the green screen or blue screen, where the spill of the uh, of what you let, let actually the spill of green screen doesn't come on to him and those kind of things so or else it is about like just uh, getting what you want and the, the, the best possible way it is like see when, uh, see we, we don't have any rules like in films we don't have rules in vfx lighting also like we don't have rules like it is like based on the what kind of a shot you are doing uh, you should actually formulate or come up with something which is uh, right for it Hope that uh, answers. So, in addition to that, it's, it's a case of like having an idea of what you want to achieve at the end. You, you should have an aesthetic, either, either conceptualized, approved, either from yourselves or from the DP or from the director or from the producer, whoever's taking the creative call at the end, so that everybody breaks down exactly what needs to be done, so everybody on set knows exactly what's going to happen. And again, most of the time it works, sometimes it doesn't, and sometimes you have to think on your feet. And that that that's when you start getting stressed but at the end of the day you you get what you can you try your best you get what you can at the end of the day I mean, as, as far as rules are concerned there's a few there's not many um if you if you if you're dealing with green mat it's basically you need to expose it maybe slightly under so it's not burning edges of skin for example especially for those with a darker skin tone Someone with a Caucasian skin tone, what green screens are working okay, but again, if you overexpose it, it can still burn. Uh, for uh, Don't forget that green screen actually kicks light more than color. So if you're gonna light it, you need to push the talent a little bit further away from it than closer to it, otherwise they'll get backlit. Whereas blue mats, you, you're keying the color, as opposed to green screen, you're, killing the, you're keying the luminance, really. So. If, Green screen's got a few folds in it, it's relatively okay. Cause, sorry, uh, blue screen's got a few folds in it, it's relatively okay because you're keying the color, whereas in green mat, you're keying the luminance. So, therefore, if you have folds in it, you can have problems. Uh, try and keep your tracking markers very, very close to the original color of the screen, just slightly off because tracking artists are very good and you don't need to go crazy with having massive white plus marks and X's and all that kind of stuff. It can just be off, slightly off color. So then your comp, comp artists will thank you. So they're not having to roto all this kind of stuff. And we did, we did the opposite for some of the shows that we worked on, including this one, because we had to deal with external vendors who would go, oh, hang on a minute, that's not right. But that's, that we had to cater for everybody. Um, again, this, this, is just, this is a few kind of general do's and don'ts. And generally, to be frank, have, have an idea up here and share it so that everybody knows what you're trying to achieve. Because the last thing you want to get back is back at the studio and not know what happened. And finally, on set, log everything. If you see something wrong, you see something wrong, fix it. Don't let somebody else do it. Run around, at the end of the day, you're a VFX suit. You should be exhausted by the end of the day because you've, been, you've done maybe around about 20 kilometers on set. My step count goes through the ceiling when I'm on set. Well, it used to. Now my, my guy's step count goes through the ceiling. I sit, drink coffee. Um, I'm going to take the little non-technical approach to this. I think whenever, when you're doing a green screen shot, what's very important is always have the end image in your head. So you must know what the background is going to be. What's the light like? What are you lighting for? What are you working towards? 
what are they dressed like and the only way that's going to work at the end is if you're all sure of that on set so if everyone communicates have control over the background plates that you're shooting even as a dp you know make sure that you know what time it's being shot what time is the scene set so that everything just marries because it takes one thing being slightly off and you won't be able to put your finger on it so what's off but you must know what you're lighting for and what you're shooting for so always be clear of your background when you're shooting the green screen at the, at the end of the day it's lighting uh, lighting makes a good scene look bad and a bad scene look good if your lighting matches then that's around about 60% of your job if that matches if you ma if your cg plate matches your live plate with lighting fills key etc or if you're shooting passes if they match that that's the majority of your job sorted out so that you know get that nail that and that base you know work on that baseline Wonderful. Ask one question. This is uh, twofold. One is for DOP, then another one is for uh, the VFX guys. Shooting a stereo film, uh, how is the experience vis a vis shooting a normal film? And uh, what you prefer, shooting a stereoscopic film or converting it? This is for DOP, and uh, sorry, one part is for VFX guys. How you find it like working on a stereoscopic film, VFX, and a normal film? How is it so different? And what challenges you face? I haven't done any stereo VFX work. <laughs> I've also not done it. Okay. But <laughs> but it's a very creative choice whether to do it uh, in stereoscopic or uh, you want to do it in uh, 2D. It is like uh, just a creative choice. And uh, it is uh, more than creative, I think it's a budget uh, choice. Because the cost really escalates uh, when you're doing uh, stereoscopy, like probably uh, since uh, for every shot, every frame you are working double the things like for example because you are uh, you are, you are uh, shooting with two cameras or something two cameras so you need to actually work for vfx guys uh, it is actually double the thing so it is more of a creative uh, choice so if you are if you have the budget and you have the subject to do it i would prefer like if you like 3d then yeah go ahead do it why not primary thing when you come into shooting something like you know moving the, 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 the thing that takes time on set or one of the key things that takes time on set is getting the camera from that grip to that grip and, and lighting for that imagine that same thing but you're doing it for two cameras plus you've got to sort the intellectual convergence as well so you've got to adjust the convergence for every single thing so not only when they're racking focus you've also got to rack the convergence as well so when I when I look at something and I move forward my, my eyes go like this as I'm coming in and out. That also needs to match one, when, when you're pulling focus. I'm just so adding one thing to it. It's like more close to the eye. Sorry? The way human eye looks at the things. Yes, yeah, exactly. The 3D is more close to that. Yeah, I mean, the, cam the cameras are, the lenses are actually the same distance apart. It's a natural thing to do with stereoscopic compared to like it's behaving like a human eye. I mean, there's, there's two ways to do that. I mean, one, you can actually be, do it by uh, fixing the cameras parallelly and then doing that interactual convergence, interactual convergence in post, and then you've got the control back in post to do that. So in essence, you're working for two separate lenses that way, or you can do it in camera. One is better than the other one because in post itself, you end up having to do some more shearing and paintwork to fill in the gaps. Whereas uh, in, if you're doing it in camera, it feels, feels more natural and fluid, but it takes longer. And like I say, you've got to shift both cameras from two, one grip to another grip, and that takes time. Um, there's been uh, several features you know, here that's been done in stereo work, and they've, they've gone over budget, or they've, they've taken longer, and, and has the result been what people have wanted to be achieved? Possibly, possibly not. You look at Peter Jackson, why on earth is, you know, why is he succeeding? Why has he managed to do it? He's done loads of stuff in 48 FPS in... in, in um, in 3D, how did he manage it? Very, very straightforward. He had a ton of money. And he had a ton of money because every single grip had a camera set up already preset. So he just went, <laughs> camera, done. He didn't need to strike it from Jimmy and put it on a tripod or put it on a dolly or something like that. He had one for dolly, he had one for tripod. He had so many, he had a room full of rigs that was already preset. Can, he could just play. Sorry to interrupt. Sorry. Can creativity will address the money issue because this will be an ongoing process always. Money is short, money is short. Uh, so that, how can... Again. One, I'm saying can creativity will address the money issue because now we are in a very good position, the kind of 
tickets and people are paying for the tickets and all it's a better no. situation <laughs> back like 5 years no. back now see, we are in a better see it, it first of all it is as a creative choice it should be in the subject whether the subject needs it or not that's a, that's where it starts yeah. and if you have the thing your subject needs it then you pitch to a producer who can invest so much then you can actually do it so if, actually it, uh, because see it involves so many people so much of I think that is why it needs money. See, cinema is actually like a, a storytelling process, and I understand, but it is a very expensive storytelling process. Everyone, yeah, everyone wants to make a film, but only a few are possible because, like, if I have an idea, I need to also have the money to do it. So, if I have an idea which is actually like which I feel that it can be done in 3D to be more effective, then I try to go and pitch to that guy who can actually who has the money to put in, and if he does it, yeah, why not? it is purely upon the subject which you are doing whether it deserves it or not whether it requires it or not that's the choice as filmmakers sometimes what we tend to forget is cinema is a commercial art and i think the commercial fulfillment is as important as our creative fulfillment because if we don't respect that part of it we'll get one film to make our entire lives so it's not necessary that creative will be compromised because of commercial or you know that we cannot it's not that there is a story in the world that cannot be told in 2D and only in 3D of course if you can do it and the money permits i think it's a money issue with 3D more than anything else can you afford to shoot a film in 3D because it everything else you know the cost multiplies tremendously so if you can it'll be great but it's not the only way to ever tell a story so i don't think creative suffers at the hands of commercial in that sense so i think it's been a very interesting question and answer session and it's time to wind up right now uh, Thank you for your informative talk. Uh, I now open the stage for a round of questions. Very good evening. My question is to Priya. Uh, what I heard is for airlift, except one small news item uh, published in Gulf News uh, during that crisis, there was no any research or reference material. So how much challenging for you to uh, Um, go through that subject i'll tell you for the yeah, for the visual there was a lot of reference material that i had which i could look at there was a lot of journalistic work from the war because it's based in uh, the war of 1990 saddam invading kuwait so there's lots of journalistic material on the net there's a lot of photographs there's books journalists have written and i find for myself i react much more to the spoken word of what i read and photographs like i don't need to see videos to make films so there was plenty of material on the net of that time period of what you know it was summer so what the light feels like what the weather was what people were wearing what you know all of that there's plenty material on the net and in books and magazines and i found a lot of old second hand uh, photographers books who had documented stuff during the war so there was enough material to go around actually so that's untrue that there wasn't much hello uh, myself danny i'm an actor Uh, my question to uh, Sintal or anybody can answer. Like uh, new people, new idea, new generation, youngsters entering in the film industry, they have uh, great knowledge, great ideas, creativity. But uh, I'm talking about the low-budget films. If they have the creativity and uh, they want to shoot it or VFX, it's a budget-making uh, process, as I know. so what you people recommend for them uh, to uh, go with a higher budget but the producer is not accepting for the higher budget for the vfx but it has the very creativity things they want to create it uh, what you suggest us should we go for that or should we drop the ideas how make friends with <laughs> <laughs> see like uh, see our uh, generally like uh, film industry is uh, driven with creativity and also with the budget so if you have a better way of like if you are don't have a budget try to find a way of telling the story in a very interesting way if you have the budget yeah go to pete go to any other guys and uh, get your vfx done so it is uh, there is no nothing about dropping the idea some people had the ideas and till they found the producer and till they had the money they like were with it and it is just about your persistence of uh, how much you are dying to do that film and like uh, to how long you can persist 
so if you want sometimes even the greatest ideas can be told with the simplest possible way it is like you pushing your creative limits so till what level you want to push your creative limits that's a that's a very individual thing i can't suggest because every individual has his own experience and the own way of looking at uh, those kind of a things every single feature runs to its runs, runs to its budget as best as it can yeah you maximize the budget as best you can and the best thing really you can do at the end of the day is plan it allocate it up, but don't don't you know if you if you need to achieve a lot of stuff in a certain department be it uh, within camera, within art department, within costume, within VFX, no matter what area of the creative process, you have to plan and you have to allocate resources to it. Again, time, quality, money. At the end of the end of the day, your entire piece may be shot beautifully, but if you've got literally, you know, 20 pence in the button for your for your post work, then you're gonna ha you're gonna only be able to afford people who will cost 20 20 pence in the button. To be frank, that that's what you, that's what you're gonna get. So you're gonna get that level. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's 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 tough. It's tough. We've all we've all worked on features where, um, you know, budget suddenly bottlenecks, or like I, in one department over another department, I've had it. Everybody else, pretty much in this room, has had it. These guys definitely had it. So it's a case of you know, you try and maximise what you have, and make sure you don't go over. And that's that's down to the production that's down to making sure that everybody's on the same page when you're on a set it's making sure that in your pre-production work is planned and everybody's got a very very clear idea of everything that's going to happen and in a tighter schedule and a tighter budget things are actually you know regimented very 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 strictly I mean, you look at for example the uh saw franchise if anybody's seen that the horror the horror film franchise the first film that they made, they shot everything, the entire film, in two weeks. Exactly two weeks. Uh, to the point of, like, some shots they couldn't even afford. They could afford a grand total of two takes. Two takes per shot. That's it. If you didn't get it by the second take, moving on. That's, that's it. Even to the point of they utilized witness cameras and they couldn't even achieve to go and across and actually shoot those ones for the actual principal take. So they actually dummied it, graded that footage and made it look like CCTV footage and slotted that in. And then just did an ADR over the top for the, for the dialogue track. They did the entire thing because they, they, they had a very, very limited budget and, very, and thus a very, very limited time. So, but they achieved it and they've now done seven films. And it's now just come back. It's just new ones just been released. The eighth film in the franchise has just been released, and it 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 blew everything out of the water. But they, because they were frugal, they were they were absolutely they made sure everything was regimented. And you have to do that. It's you know it's a it's a it's a creative process, yeah. But you you got to at some point, you know, if, if finance and time are therefore dictating it, you you got to be you got to you got to be strict. Simple. I think what we don't value enough here is the smaller the budget and the tighter the film, the more prep you need to do. And here what we end up doing is the smaller the film, the less the homework we do. And you get on set and everyone doesn't, you know, people are all over the place. The reason they can shoot in two weeks because they probably prepped for four months before that. And we're never willing to do that here, you know, to put in those four months of rigorous work so that you can make your shooting schedule shorter and actually then probably put VFX in or do whatever you require because Every shoot doesn't have to be 50 or 60 or 70 days, but that will only come down the longer we prep. <laughs>